Welcome to Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw. As always, I'm so glad you're here today because we have someone very, very special that we're going to be talking to. His name is Dylan Bender, and I know him because he was my dad's therapist for three years at the VA, which took my dad from a guy who had had PTSD for 66 years to a man who's functioning beautifully now with no remnants of those PTSD symptoms. So this is a show you are not going to want to miss. So stay with us. Very shortly, we will be talking with Dylan Bender. First of all, I just want to say welcome again. I am your host, Paula Shaw. I am an author, a speaker, and a life transition coach. My books are Chakras, The Magnificent Seven, which is all about balancing those energy centers of the body that we call chakras. And my second book was called Grief, When Will This Pain Ever End? And that was a question I heard way too many times in my 28 years of practice from people who had suffered loss and were just going through the agony that grief can bring. And then my latest book is called Saying the Right Thing When You Don't Know What to Say. And that was kind of my little passion project because too many days, too many times, too many sessions, people would say to me, no one said anything, or no one showed up, no one came, or They said the most horrible things about how I should be grateful that I had him for as long as I did. You know, those kinds of things. And what I know for sure is people are not insensitive. People don't want to do damage. In fact, one of the reasons they often don't show up or don't bring it up is because they don't know what to say and they don't want to make things worse. So saying the right thing when you don't know what to say is a great little book that can really help you say the right thing when you're trying to comfort somebody or you're having a conversation with your friend who's dealing with emotional pain. And by the way, if you jump on my website, paulashaw.com, you can get a free gift that's taken from that book. It's called 20 Things to Say and Not to Say to people in pain. So please grab that, keep it in your glove box, your purse, your briefcase, so that you can give it a quick glance when you need to have those difficult conversations. And then one last reminder, if you want to hear past shows, if you want to see the show notes, you want to learn how to get in touch with guests and that kind of thing, Go to changeituprradio.com, and on the Listen In tab, you can find past shows and the show notes on each show. And you can also find on that website information about being a guest or a sponsor of this show. So that's changeituprradio.com. All right. All the initial stuff is done now. We get to get to the good part. We are going to meet Dylan Bender. So let me first tell you a little bit about him. He is currently a readjustment therapist, and he's also working with performance therapy with the Veterans Health Administration at the Vet Centers Program. He works with active duty and veterans transitioning back into civilian life after combat deployment. He's been working in this area for 10 years and has over 20,000 clinical hours in working with combat veterans. He is, by the way, a veteran himself, so he certainly knows from where he speaks. He got out of the Marines in 2004 to pursue his clinical uh, studies in psychology He did his graduate work at Azusa Pacific School of Psychology and received an MA in clinical psychology. So the man has great training and he knows what he's talking about, both from experience and professionality. 
He's currently involved with developing and implementing programs that are addressing transitioning out of the military, the marriage failure rate, and the suicide epidemic among military, which is something we really want to talk about today because it's a huge problem. And he is about to release his first book called The Warrior's Dilemma, which takes an in-depth look at the difficulties military men and women have reintegrating into society. So Dylan, please join us so we can start talking about all this cool stuff. There he is. Hello, Dylan. Hello, Paula. So great to have you with me. Thank you so much for being on my show today. So let's kind of start at the beginning. You were a Marine yourself. And did you do active duty? Yeah, so I joined, I actually had a unique experience because I joined in peacetime, well, relatively peacetime, 1997. Mm -hmm. So I joined the military. And then um, I was a Marine, always wanted to kind of be a Marine and do that. And then I was, I was convinced to be an infantry Marine. Um, so I was an infantry Marine my first four years in the Marine Corps. And then I moved on and I did a second enlistment. And in that second enlistment, when 9-11 took place. Ooh. And so it was interesting to be in the Marine Corps to see it go from a peacetime organization mm -hmm. to a wartime organization mm -hmm. and to see that impact of that change. Um, <clears throat> and then I got out. Oh, sorry, I shifted. In my second enlistment, I became a, a reconnaissance Marine. Um, so for in the Marine Corps, the reconnaissance community is more con considered kind of our special operations community, the reconnaissance, force reconnaissance community. And so then, mm -hmm. so I did my second enlistment in that. And then after uh, doing my deployments and everything, I got out of the Marine Corps in 2004, um, and then that's where I decided to go to school and figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Um, and so that kind of produced me. I was, I was not anticipating going into this field at all. Mm -hmm. I, I completely loved this field. I was, I was actually in school for Bible and theology to become a pastor. And I was pastoring even at a church oh for my. a little while. Oh, my. <laughs> um, what the unique thing was is here I am doing that studying all of this, you know, spirituality and theology. And, and I had a college age group and I get all these Marines in there, all these Marines. And I'm in Oregon, I'm in the middle of nowhere, you know? Mm -hmm. And so all these Marines started attending my group and, and we're all kind of struggling and I see the struggles and I see it. And I kind of saw the writing on the wall, like, and this is in 2007, mm -hmm. 2006, 2007. And I was like, I really got to make, I saw the wave building. The wave building of the impact of war. I see. And so, that, that, so that's when I made the uh, this decision to kind of leave that vocation that I was pursuing and pursue this vocation. And then that's when I ended up, I, for me, as being a Marine, I was like, I, I had to go back to the hub for the West Coast. And so I came back down to Southern California because that's where Camp Pendleton was. And then that's where I pursued my clinical psychology degree. And from there, I went straight into the, got hired at the VA in a unique program that uh, does readjustment counseling for combat veterans. That's kind of yes. our niche yes. for combat and military sexual trauma. Really, our focus niche is trauma mm -hmm. and helping people overcome that. But we ex we've expanded in the sense that we started working a lot more with active duty as well, because we're a unique organization. Normally, you know, if you're if you are DOD, if you're active duty, your DOD's responsibility. If you're I a see. veteran, you out, you're the VA's responsibility. Uh, There's not really a relation that kind of helps you covers both. And that's where the vet centers came in. The vet centers help kind of cover that. So we are a perfect organization for a transition of helping people to go from that warrior culture back into the civilian culture. Yes. So, sorry, and you know. More Long, 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 I, it has been one of the things that was so, to me, crazy and upsetting that I remember when I did my my internship, I was in a psych hospital and I literally sat with one of my patients who told me that one day he was on the streets of Hanoi 
And the next day he was on the streets of San Francisco with no transitioning uh, work, no therapy, nothing to help him adjust. And uh, if I'm correct, what I, I understand, Dylan, is this is part of the problem that's leading to and has led to so much veteran suicide. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so just to give you a little backstory, because I was taught as it was as I was in school and then in my internship at the VA, it was like PTSD was the big thing. And it was, right. I won't say it was known, but it was the big buildup. Mm-hmm. And so we would spend all our time working on PTSD and just focus on PTSD, which is a very real and a very powerful thing. Yes. But I started to notice is when I would work with these young men or women and we would reduce the PTSD symptoms. And your father was a perfect example of reducing those PTSD symptoms, reducing those PTSD symptoms. There was still something lingering. There were still problems. There were still, and we didn't know what to call it. You know, it was, we didn't know what to call it. Well, it's not, it's not PTSD anymore, but it's mm-hmm. this deep struggle that's going on. And so I started digging. I started researching. I started looking at some of the research where it started correlating some of these suicide rates. Um, like in 2014, it was one of the ones that really impacted me because it was the Pentagon data. We've been in war for multiple years, and we were still having pretty active combat deployments in around 2014. And to see the suicide rate among active duty was over 50% of, from their oh. data, wow. were committing suicide having deployed to a combat zone. So Wait a minute. 50% going, of the, the military were committing suicide and they had never been in combat? Is yeah. That so what? of the, suicide, the suicides that were followed through in 2014, yeah. it was like 51 or 52%. They were, they weren't even, they didn't deploy to a combat zone and yet oh they were still God. attempts on their life. And then we, we take that, not to say that um, other studies have come out and I, I do have these in my book and they, uh, these studies and highlighting them, the studies that came out that said even I, I one really impactful study um, from uh, suicidology and behavior mm-hmm. highlight that PTSD and depression by itself led to less suicide attempts than reintegration stress. So reintegration stress was considered more of an indicator for suicidal ideation Mm. than PTSD and depression combined. Now, don't get me wrong. Can can PTSD and and depression contribute to reintegration stress? Yes, they can. So it's not a simple like silver bullet, but it was finally they were starting to identify there's something else going on. There's something else going on besides just PTSD and depression. And that's where I really started started digging and it started hitting home because I was like, that's exactly, that's what I'm seeing with people. Mm-hmm. And every once in a while, like, because we're a VA center, they would have, we'd have people that are not combat veterans come in and they're deeply struggling. And we would, of course, we'd work with them, even though it's not our niche. We work with them just to kind of stabilize them mm-hmm. before we can refer them to, we call it the big VA. But it's just a unique, um, something unique going on. And that's where I started prompting. I kept saying, this is the whole thing that prompted the book. I was like, I kept saying, somebody will write about this. Somebody will do this. Somebody will, <laughs> somebody will put it out. And not just for journal studies. Because here's the thing is veterans and active duty, they're not going to read journal studies. Right. They're not going to read those things. So it's like, well, somebody will write about it. Somebody will do. And every time I started kind of picking up a book and looking at the latest books coming out on transition and everything, they were either about jobs or benefits. Uh, um, there was a lot out there of going on what's going on internally mm-hmm. that's bringing these veterans to like, you know, following through with suicide or making suicide attempts or the other thing, especially in or destroying the family. Uh, it kind of shocks people when I tell them the divorce rate is increases for many veterans once they get out of the military. Yeah. Let me ask you, Dylan, would you please explain for our listeners, what is reintegration stress? <clears throat> so I'm glad. Great question. So generally, they would define reintegration stress as that loss of camaraderie, the loss mm-hmm. of like losing that tribe 
camaraderie movies, the, the brother and sisterhood that you've built through pain and suffering, mm-hmm. the loss of where you're sleeping around one another all the time, losing that, losing that tribe, mm-hmm. and then pretty much going into isolate. Uh, uh, Junger writes a great book called Tribe, where he really, that was one of the good transition books, really identifying that loss of the tribe and how powerful it is. That's mm-hmm. one fact. The other factor is this idea of not feeling like you fit in anymore. Mm-hmm. Like you left this community, this culture, and you come back in and now you don't fit anymore. You, you stand out. There's, you don't click back in. So there's something different about you. And this is for combat and non-combat. Mm-hmm. And you explained to me when we were talking about how the military turns you into a warrior. Almost, a, I love the analogy you used about sheep and wolves. Can you uh, explain that to our listeners? This is an important concept. So we, we generally, they'd say there's three types of people in the world. And it's very commonly in law enforcement that though this type of literature, that they're sheep, we, we, there's the general populace that's so there grazing, just kind of going about day to day life. Not to say oblivious, it's not meant to be demeaning. It's mm-hmm. just the sheep in life. And then you have the wolves. The wolves are those who are out there, criminals or you know terrorists that actually are out there trying to prey on the sheep. Mm-hmm. That the goal is they're hunting sheep. And then you have a different type of person when you be your sheep dogs. The sheep dogs commonly look at life for uh, law enforcement first responders of those mm-hmm. who feel that internal drive to want to protect the sheep. And so they're they're there protecting the sheep. And what I, I use, I stretch that metaphor is because it's similar with military, is what we do is uh, you get people that join, that join the military so that that pulls something out. People that would be willing to volunteer to join the military. But I'll tell you, it's like, I sometimes I would you would like to say it's because they had an honor and duty. I was like, I don't know. I joined for the uniform because I thought it'd be a great. <laughs> <you know>? so, <laughs> a chick magnet, huh? <laughs> so it's like, okay, I'd like to say it was because of duty and honor, but or some, some people's benefits. But so whatever way you're you're getting people to step out in that metaphor to say, hey, make us like a sheepdog, but we're a different type of sheepdog. Mm. We put these sheepdogs and you put them in a pack and you make them very aggressive and you teach them to hunt. And then you send them places to hunt wolves very mm-hmm. aggressively. Like I mean, imagine a pack of hounds that are out there hunting, looking for wolves. And then the trick, the hard thing that comes back is that you bring these these pack animals back, back into the civilian environment, and then you put them back in with the sheep. And only a small fraction of them go to be law enforcement or first responders. Right. So you have a majority of them that they're put back in with the sheep, but they're not sheep anymore. Mm. And in that metaphor, when they've come from that environment back then, every any dog trainer would say, oh, you're going to have problems. Well, it's kind of obvious. We're going to yes. have problems. But the problem is not because they're broken. The problem is, is they are what you made them to be. Mm-hmm. And now very little time, effort, and energy gets put into remaking them. Yes. Now, it is a very tricky thing because uh, warriors – Put a lot of identity in being a warrior, mm-hmm. and so it's a, like, well, that's why we call them veterans. It was like, well, I'm not a civilian, right? So I, I'm a veteran. But the, the unfortunate, uh, fortunate thing with the let's just say the pathology identification is that oftentimes veteran can be connected with like mental health issues. Mm-hmm. Um, and so mm-hmm. that's that's the unfortunate thing is with the there's a double-edged sword with the creation of awareness. Now we get the the other side of this is where you get those who now that they, they it's almost like, well, I'm not broken. Veteran is almost synonymous with feeling broken, especially if you're trying to apply for a job and yes. things like that. Oh, yes. And Dylan, this is kind of a perfect place right now for us to take a quick break. But when we come back, let's talk about that because – the veterans experience once they're on the other side of their service is a real problem for so many. So stay with us. We will be right back. 
Welcome back to Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw and my guest today, Dylan Bender, who is a therapist at the VA and is working with veterans who are reintegrating back into society and also with those dealing with PTSD and who have been in combat. So Dylan, we were that that was such a fascinating analogy that you just talked about in the last segment about how we remake these sheep regular sort of regular society people into wolves and and then we expect them to reintegrate into society with no help for the most part correct yeah, yeah. and so the, the good idea the thing is is there's, Actually, it's not the- I have to correct myself. We don't make them into wolves because those are the bad guys. We make them into sheepdogs. It yeah. was the analogy you yeah. used. And, yeah. But still the problem is the same. Then now their military service is done and we just release them back into the real world with no transition work. Go ahead. And- it's not to say that the military look. The military hasn't done this. I want to give the military credit. Is like they will do classes. They will do things mm-hmm. like we, for for the Marine Corps. It's called PAPS, or it was when I went through. And now it's called TRS, and it's a week long class of where they're telling you um, about your benefits. They're telling you about jobs, how to do interviews, how to write a resume. But I that's see. usually dominantly what it goes to. Is it goes to benefits and new vocation, which the reality is that's the pressing need, right? We mm-hmm. want to like, okay, how do I access my benefits? And sure. what's, what am I going to do next? What's my next job? Because I'm getting ready to transition, major transition in life. What's my next job? But right. the problem is it often neglects the deeper internal work that's been done. Because here's the thing. The reality is, is making a warrior is, well, for instance, how do we take a group of people, how do we take a group of those sheep that stepped up and make them into hunting pack animals? How do we make that transition? It isn't simply teaching them how to fight. Um, for instance, for Vietnam vets, World War II vets, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan vets, many of them will tell you is just teaching people how to fight doesn't make them warriors. Mm-hmm. I've heard story after story from Vietnam vets saying, you know, the South Vietnamese army, you couldn't trust them because as soon as the bullets started flying, they were, they were gone. And because mm-hmm. we, we, we would teach them how to fight, but we, don't, we didn't create them into warriors. Warriors mm-hmm. is much deeper. Now, we've done a great disservice, even as warriors to ourselves, to say that becoming a warrior is simply a job. It is not a job. And it hasn't throughout history, it hasn't been a job. When you look at warrior tribes throughout history, mm-hmm. once a person did that, they took that different path in life because it changes you. It changes you fundamentally how you view the world, how you interact with the world, how you see yourself in the world. It's a fundamental deep shift. And that's part of this, part of me writing the book was all about trying to help warriors and maybe even family members, but I really wrote it for warriors to understand the depth of the transformation. But when I was joining the Marine Corps, they told you, we will transform you. And they did. They, yeah. they helped me work hard. They transformed me. But then they don't really re-transform you. They give you benefits. They give you, you know, things that they, that you think you need getting out and getting a job. But I tell you, I've worked with so many veterans that have gotten out, got jobs, and it was a great job, but ended up either losing the job because of deeper internal issues, mm-hmm. not problems, just to say they are used to being a sheepdog. Mm-hmm. And how that comes out with the sheep. It's like so they how they would carry themselves would either lose a job or they wouldn't be able to tolerate it. They wouldn't be able to tolerate the job because they feel like they had incompetent leadership or things uh, like that. So uh, it's like a much deeper thing going on. So in the book, I try and highlight, and I'll, just to give you a brief overview, there's four main areas of develop or of transformation. The first mm-hmm. is the commonly known as what we call the brainwashing, the, the behavioral conditioning. Now, yes. it was so funny. I remember I was in my advanced like uh, psychology classes 
and I'm learning about operant conditioning, behavioral conditioning. And it just, I just remember like light bulbs going on of like <laughs> boot camp. <laughs> like we're doing. It's all behavioral conditioning. Yes. I mean, yes. for us, it's like one of the big things, and people don't even think about this is, for instance, in the Marine Corps, you can't go outside without a cover on your head. And so without a, a, a hat, cover, we call them covers, cover on your head, uh-huh. and you can't go outside. And when you go inside, you take it off. And then, so it's almost embarrassing is that when, if you get caught without your cover, which inevitably happens because everybody's lit, trying to grab their covers, they make you walk around with your hand on your head like this is oh. because while you're outside. Mm-hmm. Now, what's unique about that, anybody who's been in the combat zone begins to realize of like, well, yeah, whenever you go outside of overhead cover, mm-hmm. you have your helmet on and right. you're meant to feel naked if you do not have that helmet on. I see. Wow. It's a very interesting. Mm-hmm. And that is just one of thousands of those conditionings that mm-hmm. go on within um, that initial conditioning. But that's what everybody thinks. That's the, And then you think, okay, well, once you get out of that, you'll adapt, you'll transition, you know, those things will go away. But that's only part of it. That's only one component. Yeah. The next component is probably one of the deepest. It's the existential conditioning. So mm. existential is where they're, they are creating an identity. They are creating a value system yes. that you will adhere to. They yes. are creating meaning and purpose in life. Mm. Your meaning and purpose is what well, we would say in general. Let's we'll say if you were asking somebody if they're in the military, it's like, hey, did you serve? Mm-hmm. Right there, it, it connotates purpose. Is like, did you serve in the military? Did you Good serve point. something bigger than yourself? Yes. So, but then you—that's just one layer. That's the biggest layer. You keep taking it down to MOS, to what service you joined. To, I mean, it is the detail of you will clearly know what your purpose is. It never fails. I'll do lectures. I'll do lectures in a class of uh, these military classes they're getting out, and I'll always ask. What's the mission of the Marine Corps Rifle Squad? And you always have one person be like, he was an infantry Marine, he goes, to locate, to close with, and destroy enemy by fire maneuver, and repel enemy's assault by fire in close combat. It's like, wow. that was his purpose. Mm-hmm. That was his purpose. That was the very essence of what he was meant to do. Wow. So this existential conditioning is much bigger. It creates an identity. Yes. And it is so critical. This is where you can... When you, a person has existential conditioning, this is how you get somebody to run towards fire versus run away from fire. I see. And this is part of the problem because that existential purpose is gone once they're no longer in the service, correct? Absolutely. Because it, that's the thing is, is once you're out, you're out. Yeah. <laughs> you're out. And, wow. and it's done. And, and, Many don't even realize how big of a hit it's going to hit them mm-hmm. until they're out, and then it's not there anymore. Yes. You may have the first six months that you're like, woo, you know, I can go where I want, do what yeah. I want. But then yeah. after a while, it starts to like, what's the point? What am I yeah. doing? Wow. Wow. What am I doing? And, so, and then the identity. The identity is, just let me give you one uh, example of ident- the identity. So here's the thing about identity is identity and purpose often attached together, Mm -hmm. but by the very nature of making a warrior, you have to make a warrior fill above the civilian populace. Right. And so in all of the military services, you'll see this conditioning where they tear you down. Mm -hmm. After they tear you down, they build you up above to fill a point of superiority. Now, why do they want us to feel superior to the civilian populace? An example is how do you, if I was taking a group of people of a hundred people, how do I take 10 of them and say, I want you to lay your lives down for these other 10 or these other 90. Uh, there's, a, there's a similar phenomenon that takes place. Like let's go with adult and children. Most adults, sheep and sheep dogs, not wolves mm-hmm. will be a child in danger 
they will put themselves in danger right. to protect that child, right. to help that child, to do that, to do that. And the question is, why? Mm -hmm. Why do they do that? It's because they conclude because they're helpless. They can't. They can't protect themselves. Yes. I, I'm compelled to protect them because I am more capable. Got it. So if you've conditioned somebody and you take them and you take them to where you make them feel above the civilian populace, now you've conditioned them to where they say, well, of course, they can't protect themselves. Mm -hmm. We have to protect them. We have to fight for them. We hold ourselves to a higher standard. We push ourselves further. We do these things. And it's not to make us to feel arrogant. It's not to doing those things, though, that sometimes is a subtle you know, or not so subtle outcome. Mm -hmm. But there's a level of they have to feel stronger. They have to feel above so that they will be the ones willing to go lay their lives down to protect others. Wow. That's a huge insight. Really makes sense. <laughs> You know, my my uh, husband was a Marine, and his father was a Marine, and his father, his father was a Marine Corps general. So I've had a lot of Semper Fi in my life, and <laughs> I've seen this condition. I mean, my husband never went into combat. He um, did what did they call it when you uh, you go through boot camp, but then you just show up every weekend for X it's amount of years. He went into the reserve. Yeah, the reserves. And yet he always had the attitude that he was a Marine and he was somehow a cut above. And it, he would yep. always say, once a Marine, always a Marine. You know, it doesn't matter if you're in service or not. And yet Absolutely. I can see that when you have been in service, when you have run toward fire, when you have felt you were the one protecting somebody from death, then you come back and you're working as a car salesman or an accountant or something. It's got to feel a little out of sync with what you were conditioned to do. I have story after story after story. <laughs> of veterans and I, I if you just opened up your lines and say hey anybody who's experienced this as a veteran call in uh -huh. and you will hear story after story of guys and gals coming back home and this feeling of not feeling like they fit in yeah feeling like they, but you got to think about that we've we've made them to feel above mm -hmm. and then they come back in and this is where it becomes we can't, you can't just assimilate. It's like identity suicide to say, okay, I come from a stronger place. So just accept that you're lesser. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to only do that. No. And so Dylan, becomes, I, you know, it's all, it's perplexed me for years. Why so many veterans end up homeless, end up dealing with mental illness, and I know, you know, we, we don't have hours to explain, and I'm sure that's a very layered issue. But in general, is are the things we've been talking about, is this part of the underpinnings of why so many veterans, A, commit suicide, B, end up homeless, um, using drugs, using alcohol? Is it because of these things we've been discussing? Well, I couldn't say in blanket statement in the sense of absolutely because there's it's always complex from childhood trauma to mm -hmm. personality disorders to combat exposures, PTSD. There's always layers, but there is a large group of the population that, that this is the issue. For instance, if they even if they didn't deploy to a combat zone, but they were taught that this is who they are and their ingrained identity, and then they have great leaders that they respect and then they come out and they can't work for anybody because they have such ingrained expectations for leaders. Yes. And they, they get, either get fired for jobs or can't tolerate working for these people. Mm -hmm. I've just heard it over and over and over again. And, and then, so then they, they end up either homeless or entrepreneurs, <laughs> veterans <laughs> are quite, quite common, or they end up homeless and, mm -hmm. 
or they, they embrace it. Like I don't fit in, I'll never fit in. So I'm just going to go to the outskirts of society. And, and then these things get compounded if we add on top of them trauma. Yes. Um, because I do want to make, there is a distinction that I, and I'm glad you have, you've been married to a Marine who hasn't deployed because you see these things in there. Mm-hmm. You see things in there, but this is what I've, over the years, what I've come to see is that what happens is you got the, you got the Marine who, or, or any military service that they were conditioned, they were trained, they were made into this. Yes. And, and even if they deployed if they blow to a combat zone or life-threatening situations, and I say life-threatening because there's, I've heard, I've heard people go under horrific trauma just due to humanitarian, or sure. probably one of the worst, one of the worst duties is it's called Keiko. It's where they're actually notifying the families of the personnel oh. killed. In that oh, I mean, yes. they never deploy to a combat zone, but that is one of the worst traumas. Mm-hmm. And so, but so we don't want to just say, but whenever they've experienced something traumatic in the venue of that identity, yeah, it's like putting it into the kiln, mm-hmm. putting it into the kiln, and it hardens it. Yeah, it hardens it so much deeper. Not mm-hmm. to say that it still didn't affect the person that didn't do that. Right. Uh, just like we say with pottery, using that metaphor, that if, mm-hmm. if it's out in the sun, it's still going to get hard. But it's that combat scenario really hardens it. And then it layers it with combat PTSD, survivor's guilt, depression, different things like that. I see. Um, but man, there's so many things we could talk about. Paul, but I, one thing I, I, especially about suicide, one of the big things I really wanted to talk about, I think it's really important, mm-hmm. that is that it's different, that people don't expect to hear is, so the warrior culture. Where cultures are always honor or performance-based cultures. Right. They, they have a standard. There's an honor or a standard to perform that you will measure up to that standard. Mm-hmm. Well, their nature, when you have an honor-based culture, the opposite of that culture is a shame-based culture. Or I should say, it's intertwined. Okay. You, you can't have an honor-based culture that isn't have a shame side to it. Okay. Because if you're not in honor, if you're not performing, then yes. you should feel shame. Now, I do not want to, this is a very loaded one, because I don't want to poo-poo what the military does, because when you're training for people for war, they should feel ashamed if they fall asleep on watch. Yes. Because it's not just your own life. It's your life, and it's the people around you, and you, so it's like, there's a level, there's an importance for that shame. Mm-hmm. Um, that shame is a powerful tool we always say there's three things to get people to comply in the military pain shame and paperwork and nobody wants to do paperwork. <laughs> uh, but boy you're, say- you're making a great point here though i can see that when you're if you're conditioned for honor and service and now you're not doing that you're automatically going to get into a shame spiral and when you feel that you are defective, bad, not doing what you came to do without purpose, I can see now better where that hopeless feeling comes in and there doesn't seem to be a reason to live. Yeah. And it's really coming to, you see military, they'll often cling to like, well, uh, where, what, sense of purpose do I have? It's the family or, or the, the marriage. Yes. And that's why I really put an emphasis on working with marriages is because the number one precipitating event that leads to a suicide attempt, nothing even comes close. It's relational distress or failure. Uh, I'm not saying that's the cause of the suicide attempt, but it's mm-hmm. the precipitating event. So I try and tell the VA, try to tell everybody, Let's work on the relationships. You work on the relationships, yes. you will mitigate that yes. suicide because it's the number one precipitating factor. Mm. And you I, know, I, go ahead. You, uh, you mentioned to me when we were talking prior to this that once someone is either in treatment or feels a connection with a community, or I would imagine a relationship that's working, that the suicide level goes down to 4%. Do I have that right? Is that the, the percentage? Yeah, 
suicide, or sorry, uh, the VA did an extensive study, uh, probably one of the most extensive studies ever done on suicide, especially with veterans. And they did the study, and what they found was, I, I'm blanking in on the exact detail, but those who were actually in treatment or getting addressed, like their own internal struggles, mm-hmm. suicide rate dropped drastically. I mean, to the point they were a small fraction of those who were actually falling through with suicide. Wow. It's the ones that are isolated, the ones that are sitting in their shame, sitting in their shame. And that's why the shame spiral, I'm so glad you understand that, is um, have you ever heard of Thomas Joyner's theory of suicide, the influences no, of suicide? I don't think so. If, if you imagine a Venn diagram, and so you got one circle, the other circle, and the third. One circle, he talks about there's a lack of belongingness. Mm-hmm. And this is in general. He's not studying veterans. Right. But the people that get to that point where there's they're highly suicidal or following through with it, mm-hmm. there's a lack of belongingness. They feel like they don't belong. They don't fit in. Mm-hmm. And then the next Venn diagram, there's a, there's a feeling of burdensomeness. Like, I'm the problem. Yes. Something's wrong with me. Yes. Um, and so, and then when you add the third component, the third component's the real lethal component is where there's a capacity for self harm. Uh, there's that capacity that's increased now, especially with veterans, if they have been conditioned and seen to use violence. Mm-hmm. Number one, number one. Uh, let's say vessel that the veterans, especially in the male community, use is firearm or wow. suicide. Wow! Number one, nothing even comes close to it. Firearm is the number one, and so it's there's a familiarity. It we've been given a capacity yes. of knowing it. It's not known, and is if you've been in combat and you've seen people die, you're like, it can be quick. Mm-hmm. It can be, quick. and so mm-hmm. now what we get is take them to this. If we take go back and you say, now you've taken the sheepdogs and placed them <laughs> back into the sheep and they're yeah. biting sheep, <laughs> uh-huh. they're biting sheep or they're not doing well because they're sheepdogs and they're aggressive. Right. And then they're, they're having struggles or their marriage isn't working out and whatever. And they feel like they don't fit in. They feel like they're not part of the community. Right. They feel like I'm the problem. What's wrong with me? Mm-hmm. What's wrong with me? And then if they've given a familiarity and a capacity for violence, in the sense, and it, it's the recipe is a perfect dis- disaster. Yep. I can see that so clearly. Dylan, you have just given us such great insights today. I wish we had another two hours to continue this conversation because I, I really honestly understand it all so much better now than I have before. Um, let me ask you this. If there is someone listening to this show who feels like you have described them, what can they do to reach out for help? Well, there's multiple re- the things. Biggest one is get out of isolation. Uh, that's what veterans do. We isolate yourself because if, if you've separated yourself from the civilians and then you don't feel like you fit in, you don't, you don't connect. You isolate yes. yourself. You don't right. make friends. You know, all, there's so many layers to it, but I would say reach out. Now you can do it with the VA. You can do it with vet centers. There's over 350 vet centers throughout the United States, the mm-hmm. VAs, but that's not always the appeal, but it can be biggest one. Well, actually a, a recent study by the Pew, Pew Research Group, interesting that they identified that the number one factor that creates uh, the ability, the resilience to overcome the transition is a robust faith practice. Wow. Interesting. They, a robust faith practice. I, I use that term because they use that term robust because mm-hmm. they're not like, okay, you, you're not going to church on Christmas and Easter. They're right. like, <laughs> you're involved. And yes. it makes sense. If the three biggest issues that a, a warrior struggles with is loss of identity, mm-hmm. loss of purpose, loss of community and culture, there's a bridge that a, a, a yes. belief faith community can create. Mm. It can create an identity that's bigger than the military and a purpose that's bigger than yourself. Yes. A community that has like mindedness. Oh, they that have is like-mindedness. so beautiful. I get it completely. 
Oh my goodness. Dylan, I'm afraid we are out of time, but you must come back again. Maybe after your book launches this summer, I'd love to continue this discussion because it's a real problem that these people who have served their country are not being served in all the ways they need to be. I I am so delighted that I have met you. I am so grateful you helped my father. He speaks about you with reverence you can't believe. And I'm just so delighted that you honored us with your presence and, and all of this knowledge that you have on this show today. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Dylan. Thank you to my listeners. And remember, if you hear this show Please, if you know someone that you think it would help, share it, share it, subscribe, you know, come back because we've got lots of good shows ahead of us as well. And if you want the show notes on Dylan Bender, they will be on changeitupradio.com. So thank you all. Remember, we're on every major podcast platform, including iHeartRadio and Potopolo, a new amazing platform. And we will see you next week where we will be talking again with another veteran or one who serves the veteran population. Thanks for being here, and we'll see you next week.